The question of the week from last week was, how do you know you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Did anybody have a have a chance to think about this over the week? Um, um the uh, evidence is speaking in tongues. Okay. What what makes you say that? Um, doesn't it say it in it? Like, what do you mean? Does it say it in it? Like, it says this is the sign of <laughs> being baptized in the. Or, I thought whenever, you know, they're in the room and uh, they're praying and then they started speaking in tongues, I thought that. Well, I see what you're saying, but we have to be careful with that because Acts is history as well. And so what Luke does is he'll record something that he's not necessarily saying that you should do as well. Like, for instance, he records Ananias and Sapphira right. pretending to... To give all of it when they when they didn't, he records uh, the apostles casting lots to figure out who's going to be the twelfth apostle. Uh -huh. They have so there's a lot of things recorded in Acts that he's not necessarily saying, "Hey, you should go and do likewise," but he's just saying this is what happened. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So is he saying in Acts two, this is what's going to happen every single time somebody's baptized in the Holy Spirit, or is he just saying this is what happened to them? Mm -hmm. So you don't. I was asking. I wasn't trying to like. No, I I was always told that. Oh, okay. All I right. was even told I like um, you know in the the um, sermons that they try to get people to be uh, mm -hmm. speaking in tongues. They use the thing that uh, that everybody in the room was baptized in the Holy Spirit and that they were speaking in tongues. So everyone be should be speaking in tongues. Okay. Mm. What you just said. Just, just I guess it's. Thing. I, I guess it's easier in, in Texas because Texas is already such a Christian center in the U.S. I think that it's easier to convince people of that. Yeah. You know, in other places, it's I think it's a little, a little bit more difficult, you know, more skeptical places like Vermont, for instance. Uh, but, but, good, but good ideas. Did you have any, anything else? Or? Um, no. Okay. I wasn't trying to be rude or anything. No, no, I, 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 I'm questioning everything. Oh, okay, all right. Well, go ahead and question away then. <laughs> any other, any other ideas, you guys? No, Zach. Um, I'm thinking. Okay, just let me know if you yeah. think of something. Diana, you got anything? Check. No, Teresa, say. that's the wrong answer. <laughs> I, I would Fast say return, that um, when you start seeing more of the Holy Spirit working in your life, you start seeing the gifts of the Holy Spirit and that developing but, in your life. Okay, like what, what do you mean? Like what things? Um, well, like we talked about the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. last week. Um, speaking in tongues being one of them. Um, right. Words... Of, of knowledge and wisdom and stuff like that when you see the the Holy Spirit using you in those things but I think as far as being baptized in the Holy Spirit it's a matter of like with salvation asking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and mm -hmm. receiving it okay okay you bills want to try and combat that or I think a lot of times that we try to make it more than that. Like, what do you mean? Like, well, like, um, like she was saying, you know, that she grew up always with the initial speaking of tongues and everything. Um, I think sometimes you may be baptized in the Holy Spirit and you may not speak in tongues right away, hmm. you know? And so then people may try to persuade you that you're not or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I've seen that some. Hmm. Okay. Does anybody want to try and argue that point, or does anybody agree with that, or? Um, I don't know if he was saying this or not, but I've I've seen people that haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit before be using the gifts of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Okay. But. 
don't know if that's true now because what I was basing that off of if they could speak in tongues or not. If there was, oh, well, no, I think one person wasn't saved and he got used. It was really. <coughs> Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and move into this then. Um, great answers. I, I really like to see you guys thinking about this. Um, there's a few things that I, I would like to offer, in my opinion. Okay, um, These are not, you don't have to agree with me in order to, I mean, there's, lee, there's, room, for, there's room for leeway here. So, yeah. um, but uh, the first thing to notice is that the Bible specifically says about how the Holy Spirit, you know, is, it does a work in us, you know, in, in the salvation process, right? Um, he 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 reveals things through our heart. He he guides us towards salvation. He once we are saved, he he begins regenerating us, right? He he changes us in our hearts, right? Um, and this is something that does not require the baptism of the Holy Spirit to happen. Okay, when you are saved, the Holy Spirit and dwells within you. Okay. Everybody understand that? Yeah. Okay. Second off, it seems to me that you don't have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to be using the gifts of the Spirit. However, it seems like there's also a rule and a breaking of the rule. Generally speaking, it seems as though the Holy Spirit uses people who are saved. However... Sometimes the Holy Spirit also use people, uses people who aren't saved. Remember, I, I said be careful about saying for sure this is the way the Holy Spirit works. With some things we can know. The Holy Spirit does work in us. He does create in us something new. Right. That is something the Bible affirms. That's something we can say, yes, the, the Holy Spirit does that. right? But then there's also this, but don't people need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to be using the gifts? No, not really, no. And then there's another thing, too. It seems as though there are two different kinds of speaking in tongues. What? I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but bear, bear witness, okay, just hold on. It seems like there's a gift of speaking in tongues. This would be like, for instance, uh, what, what Chuck brought up, okay, uh -huh. um, where it needs an interpretation. This language may or may not be an actual spoken English or a worldly language. Okay, it might be something else. Okay, we don't really know. But then it seems like there's also another kind of speaking in tongues that didn't need to be trans translated, like for instance in Acts two. It seems like there are multiple kinds of speaking in tongues. However, it's also possible that there's just one and it has different variations. Hmm. Once again, it's not abundantly clear. All right. Okay. So, keep all that in mind as we plow ahead. <laughs> the first thing is the baptism of the Holy Spirit is different from being used in the, in the Holy Spirit. Okay? All right? That's the absolutely essential that we understand that. Um, and, and the reason for that is because we need to know what we're actually looking for here. See what I mean? You can be used, like we see this happen in our church, people who have not necessarily been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but still are able to give, you know, some kind of something. Um, and why is that? Well, keep in mind that when somebody is baptized in the Holy Spirit, they do not gain the Holy Spirit. Okay? You gain the Holy Spirit when you are saved. Yeah. yeah. There's There aren't two different classes of Christians. Right. The, those using the gifts of the Spirit and those not. Or those baptized in the Holy Spirit and those not. There's one class of Christian. We all have the Holy Spirit if we are Christian. Okay, what enables us to have the Holy Spirit in us? Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Right. Okay, so let's let, let's take that and move that forward. So we know that there's two different things there: gifts of the Spirit and baptism of the Holy Spirit. So then, what is baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, baptism literally means to submerge, and so to submerge in the Holy Spirit. So what we're talking about is. Um, an over um, an overfill of the Holy Spirit in your life. Okay, it's not weird. That's the first thing that needs to be addressed. It's not something where you're going to become all weird and dress dress like a hippie and go live out in the land. It's not going to be like that. You're not going to 
uh, become someone like that you don't even recognize where it's like you're looking through a glass it's somebody else's you're just watching somebody else's life no you're still gonna be you okay the Holy Spirit does do work and you it does change you for God's glory, okay? But there's not going to be something weird. Also, you're not going to go into trances and that kind of... Trances. 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 Trance. That, sound, that sounds weird, though. Trances. Yeah. Into a trance. You're not going to go into a trance. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people experience visions and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. However, it's not like you're going to go into this... Uh, like a zombie or something, okay? <laughs> there, there's a difference yeah. there, okay? And I'm not trying to talk with... Um, in a blasphemous way of the Holy Spirit, I'm trying to separate the myth of what people have made the Holy Spirit from the reality of what the Holy Spirit is. And uh, so, okay, uh, there is a distinction. Second off, it's separate from salvation. <sighs> I mean, I don't know if there's any other way to say this. It's, it's separate from salvation. It's not something that, you know... Um, I mean, I, I feel like I've already hit this at every different angle that I need to. I'm trying to figure out if there's any other way that I that I can word this. Um, it's something where you don't have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to be saved. If you're saved, you're going to make it to heaven. Mm -hmm. That's not even what the, what the issue is. Okay. However, um, and I... I I, I don't necessarily agree with everything that he says in here, but I would still like to encourage this book. Uh, it's called uh, A Primer on Power. It's by Scott Camp. He was actually one of my professors. Uh, at Well, I never actually took him. I was set to take him, but then he ended up moving on that semester back to become evangelist. So, yeah, long story. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, it's like 10 bucks online. Uh, you can get it from, or you can get it personally from his uh, website. If you just search Scott Camp, I'm sure you can find it. If you can't, I can send you a link. Um, and and one of the reasons why I like this is one of his core things that he always talks about is the church needs the Holy Spirit. And I think he does a great job of of showing how the church needs the Holy Spirit. And it's basically a lot of the things that I've been saying. You know, the the world doesn't need more churches that care for themselves, are only there for the Christians, not for the world. We talked about that today, uh, and. Uh, are uh, don't have power. People don't need to gather in dead buildings. You know, you know, people don't need that. People need something to change them, and that's the Holy Spirit. And uh, a lot of t a lot of the denominations have actually put kind of like a limit on the Holy Spirit, and I think that's extremely stupid, considering that He is one. He is part of the Trinity. He's, he is right. God. So, um, <clears throat> okay. And there is, is a difference between being baptized in the Holy Spirit and being touched by the Holy Spirit, okay? Like, for instance, you can be worshiping and just feel something, you know, like, or comfort or something, or, you know, something like that. that doesn't mean you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit, you know, comforted you, brought you, you know, brought, brought you something. And God, Jesus says that that kind of stuff's going to happen in John, for instance. Um, so we can't say that we've been baptized in the Holy Spirit because we're saved. We also can't say it because we're using the gifts of the Spirit. We also can't say it because we felt something. So that still leaves us with the question of how do we know that we've been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, the Assemblies of God came up with this view that it, speaking in tongues is the evidence. And if you've been in the Assemblies of God long enough, you've probably heard, heard this. Now, I'm not completely sold that this is the only evidence that there ever can be. But it seems like it's frequently an evidence. Okay? Does that kind of make sense? And this is my reasoning. The book of Acts records five different times key points when people are, are, are baptized in the Holy Spirit. In occurrence 1, 3, and 5, speaking in tongues goes with it. In occurrence 2 and 4, it says... They saw, which could mean that they saw the Holy Spirit being poured out with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Could mean. However, Luke doesn't specifically say, however, he does say in instance 1, 3, and 5 that this, the, the speaking in tongues was the evidence. So you're kind of left with this. It could be, it could not be. It seems like a lot of the time, the speaking in tongues is 
the evidence. However, to then take the stance of the Samus of God to say that it is the only evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit, or baptism, yeah, filled Holy Spirit, filled and baptized, the same thing, same same idea, okay, um, is for me it's a little bit of a leap for me. I understand a lot of people stand by that, and I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm just I don't want to hop down somebody's throat and say, no, you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit just because it doesn't fit that. You know what I mean? Does that kind of make sense? And kind of like what Chuck was saying. I have a really hard time of telling somebody, no, you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I kind of put that around the same area as telling somebody, no, you aren't really saved. I just don't really feel like that's my right to say. See what I mean? <laughs> Does that kind of make sense? It's it's obvious if somebody's not really filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, they don't they don't... Fruit. Yeah, they don't produce the fruit. They act weird. They they right. think that acting weird is somehow the fruit of the spirit, and it's just like no, that's not really what what happens with the Holy Spirit. So I think that that's evident, and in the same way, I think that it would be evident if someone was filled with the Holy Spirit. Is their life changed towards the good of God's kingdom? Are they encouraged to witness more? Because when people are baptized with the Holy Spirit. They experience things, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, so I don't really want to get into it. But there's there, there's something that happens when people are baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, um, so is there any other evidence of speaking in tongues? Now, here's where it gets a little bit dicey. There are no other evidences of being baptized in the Holy Spirit other than speaking in tongues in the Bible. That's where Assemblies of God has definitely has a one-up in their in their view. There is no other recorded. But, however, an argument from silence is not truly an argument, is it? Well, President Obama didn't say that he poisoned people. That must mean that he poisoned people. See what I mean? Like, just because it doesn't say something doesn't mean that it for sure is something. So, once again, we're left with the possibility of it could be, and it could not be. <laughs> once again, going back and forth on this. I will say this. When you're filled with bachelors of the Holy Spirit, you're going to know. You're going to know. Like, it's something where you feel this power, and it's not like a human power. Like, you feel fired up. It's not like that. It's like you feel the it's There's no other way to describe it. It's like you feel the hand of God. You know what I mean? You, you, you feel empowered to witness. All of a sudden, reading your Bible, praying, those aren't just sudden, those aren't just things that you do. They have meaning and they have purpose. You know what I mean? The Holy Spirit sets you on a course. That kind of makes sense? Right. It's not just getting fired up. This is getting fired up. You get all, whoo, whoo, and then like two or three days, uh -huh. you're right back to your normal self. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's you got excited about something. See what I mean? But when the Holy Spirit moves in power, what happened, to the, what happened to the church when the Holy Spirit moved? They went out. They worshiped God. That's the first thing that happened, right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship. That they, they were encouraged to persevere in the way, but then they didn't stop there. They went out and told other people, and the church grew rapidly by thousands in a day. See what I mean? Peter, who just weeks before had, had denied Jesus, right. is now proclaiming from a rooftop that Jesus is the only way to salvation, and that the Holy Spirit is something for everyone if they will just receive it. See what I mean? Like, that's quite a powerful change. Well, what happened in Peter? Well, the Holy Spirit happened. So, yes, um, we are stuck with a little bit of a dilemma. If, if there are other evidences of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, why didn't Luke record them? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But I kind of take Chuck's, what, what Chuck said. I, I kind of I side more with Chuck than with, with the semis. I say this as a general rule because there's a lot of weird people who believe weird things. I say, yeah, sure, that uh, this, speaking in tongues is evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. But in here, I'm not really convicted of that. Right. I'm more of convicted of kind of what Chuck said. You know what I mean? Like, I think there are some times when, when people potentially have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, you know, then you throw dogma down their throat. Oh, well, I don't think because of – well, it's like, well, that doesn't really matter what I think. See what I mean? And with all things considered, I think that that's a good place to hold yourself to. Expect for speaking in tongues to be the be the evidence. Expect that in yourself, okay? And if God moves, you'll know it one way or another, okay? But 
don't hold other people to standards. The same as you wouldn't hold other people to standards for salvation, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't believe that you're really saved. It doesn't matter what I think, does it? <laughs> well, I don't really think that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, it doesn't really matter what I think now, does it? See what I mean? Right. Now, obviously, you know, th there needs to be some uh, things addressed if things are get out of hand. If someone claims to be saved but they're sleeping around, for instance, well, right. we know that they're not really saved. If someone claims to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and they're doing things like the holy urinations and the, and the snake handling that we were talking about, we know that they're just doing things for show. Mm -hmm. And Acts records that happening too. Like, for instance, with the, um, what was his name? Simon or whatever. Who, you know, oh yeah, I, I want to, yeah, Simon the Sorcerer, I want to buy this from you so that I can wow people too. <clears throat> See what I mean? Like, you can tell, you can tell the, tell the difference. Um, so, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, let's uh, check that out. It encourages further love and service. I already mentioned this, so I don't really feel the need to elaborate too much on this. You guys understand this, right? It, it, it encourages us to go out and serve people, mm -hmm. to truly love people, rather than than loving them so that we can get something back. Right. Okay. Um, it encourages devotion to God. It encourages us to seek after God, to worship God, to, to, to get in the Word, to, to seek Him in prayer. You know, It encourages this kind of behavior, uh, because once again, the Holy Spirit is going to do things that glorify God. Okay, so um, it discourages worldly indulgence. When the Holy Spirit moves, you're, you're is moving in power. Your first idea is not, "Hey, I'm going to go look at porn." No. It's not, "Hey, I'm going to go cheat on my wife." It's not, "Hey, I'm going to go uh, listen to music that you know discourages me." It's, "I'm going to go." D no, that's not. You know, it's, it doesn't do that. When when the Holy Spirit moves in, in power, you're motivated to to stop doing things that, that the world says are, are, hey, it's okay to do it. You know, get drunk. Why not? Do drugs. Who cares? It, encur it, it encourages you to stop doing that kind of thing. Um, it encourages a burden for God's kingdom where you actually care that people that people get saved. You want to be a part of it. You want to see people saved. You want to have an impact on other people's lives. Um, and it, encur it, it, it doesn't just encourage you. It, it enables you to do it. There are some things in ministry that you just cannot do without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I said this, and I said it, and I'll say it again. Jesus was so certain that the church needed the Holy Spirit that he told them not to witness to people. He told them to go to Jerusalem and wait. Evidently, Jesus thought that it was so important that he thought witnessing needed to be held off on until it was established. That's quite a powerful statement. And then when it was given, it wasn't just given to the spiritual elite. It was given to everyone who was there. Man, woman, young, old. Like That's quite a powerful thing that, that happened. Okay, So I think that it definitely doesn't need to be underplayed. In fact, I think in the church world, it's been underplayed too much. Ah, yeah. oh, the Holy Spirit, whatever. We don't really need that, whatever. It messes up our schedule. It... It's uncomfortable. It, uh, you know, you have a lot of fakers. You have a lot of we might yeah. Have to sing a different song. Do what? <laughs> we might have to sing a different song. We might have to sing a different song. You know, all these <laughs> yeah. different things, and, and and that's true. The Holy Spirit does inconvenience the church, absolutely. But it wasn't our church, anyways. No, it's, it's His church. Yeah. So I think He can lead us however the heck He wants to lead us. You know, I think that I think that's something that kind of gets a little bit off off hand there. You know, and and I'm all for schedules. You know. <laughs> We're going to start service at 10. Well, that's a good idea. We should tell people a certain time that we're going to start. Okay, absolutely. But, however, the problem I have is worship is going to go from 10 to 10.17. From 10.18 to 10.20. Now I have a problem. That's over scripting a service. Yeah, I don't believe in scripting services, okay? I also don't believe in scripting words and moves of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe in that. Now, I believe sometimes the Holy Spirit will give you a word out of a service to give in a service. I've seen that. For instance, this happens with the pastor, mm -hmm. right? The Holy Spirit lays on a pastor what to preach that Sunday. He doesn't give it to him Sunday morning, does he? Yeah. See? Right. But he still preaches it on Sunday morning, right? Uh -huh. So I think there are... But one but one thing I would... Very, very quick here. Don't do that thing where you go out and you walk in the woods and you're like, I've had a real encounter with the Lord. And so you go in and you bust open the doors and you say, everybody pay attention to me. Thus saith the Lord. You, you know, I, I, no, yeah. no, 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 no. That's you showing off and you trying to get all the attention on you. I'm talking about where the Lord specifically incur and lays on your heart and says, say this. Okay. If it's the Holy Spirit, he has to tell us to say it. 
If it's us, we can't wait to say it. Another There's is, a difference. Go ahead. If it's him, it's going to be about him. If it's right. us, it's normally going to be about us. Right, right. And, and, <laughs> and, and be careful of doing this, the whole spiritual mountaintops. You know, I'm having a good week, so now let me troll off for thousands of things, blessings, and I have all the words of the Lord because I had a good week. But then what happens when we have a bad week? The Lord isn't speaking today. I'm pretty sure that the Lord speaks regardless of how our week went. Yeah. See what I mean? So be careful of emotional highs where people hype you up and say, you, yeah, you know, I'm signing up for everything in the church. I have 50 words of the Lord. I I, I, I have personal words I need to go tell. Zach, the Lord told revealed this to me. I went off to the mountaintop. And I – be careful with this kind of stuff. Okay? Be careful with this kind of stuff. Remember the seven criteria from last week? One of them was that it had to be submitted to the other people. Remember that? Uh -huh. What self-proclaimed prophets do? Okay? They go in there and they say, I'm not under somebody else's authority. I'm under God's authority. You can't tell me what to do. Uh -huh. Yeah, you are under the pastor's authority. Yeah, yeah you are. Uh -huh. that just, that's just how it works. Uh -huh. In fact, the Bible calls pastors overseers, shepherds, which, which means that you are the sheep, right? Uh -huh. Which means, does the sheep tell the shepherd that it's not going to listen to him? No, it gets the hook around the neck if it does, doesn't it? See what I mean? That's just the way that God established a church. But the shepherd has someone even over him. The great high shepherd is Jesus. Right. So if, so if a pastor is, is abusing his authority, we know that God holds him accountable, right? Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. Now, obviously, the pastor doesn't have authority to do things like tell you not to move, dictate your life and your job. Tell you what to, what to – he doesn't have that authority. I'm not trying to argue right. that at all. Right. Okay? But I am saying that when it comes to the church and spiritual matters, the church and the pastor is the authority of that. And what some people have done is because they can't handle authority in their lives. I'm so spiritual with the Holy Spirit, I don't need you. I'm more spiritual than the pastor anyways. I never learned anything at the church anyways. It's just dead. I don't get fed. So I'm going to go somewhere else or I'm going to start my own house church. See what I mean? Yeah. If you think you're more spiritual than someone else, you're less spiritual than you think you are. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because that would mean you're prideful, and you're so prideful you don't even know that you're prideful, which means you're blind. Mm -hmm. Which means you need the doctor more than <laughs> the other person you think needs the doctor. So we've got a real paradox there. So, anyways, um, I'm trying not to leave anything out, but I know I probably have. We're going to look at a few passages here. And I want you guys to pay attention to, the, to, to, to what's being said and what's going on, okay? Because I want you guys to, to really think about this. Acts chapter 2. And if you have any questions, I'm going to stop at the end of each verse so you guys can ask them, okay? Acts chapter 2, verse 4, that says this. And, there were, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, this is the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It happens in Acts chapter 2. Okay? Did everybody get that one? I'll read it one more time. Just kind of pay attention to what's going on here. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? All the people there. Now, all the people in Jerusalem. All the people in, in the upper room. Um, and began to speak in other tongues. Okay? So then we have the second part of the sentence. The first part of the sentence was they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Everyone who was there. Okay? Second part is that uh, they began to speak in other tongues. Okay, and then the third part, as the Spirit gave them utterance. It's a very important part of that verse. We talked about this before. Okay, chapter eight, verse fourteen through seventeen. Now, once again, pay attention to, the, to what's going on here. Now, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So basically what's happening is there's people in Samaria who are getting saved. And the church is like, okay, but we need to make sure that they get the Holy Spirit, that they receive the Holy Spirit. So, you know, you guys go there, instruct them, whatever it takes, pray for them, make sure that they get the Holy Spirit, okay? For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, there are basically three different baptisms that a Christian encounters. The first is salvation. This is something that happens in your spirit. You're spiritually baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, right? But then there's a second baptism. This one 
when when people baptize you, they either baptize you in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, when when that happens, this is this is the water baptism. This is basically a a, a outward sign of what happened in your spirit. Okay. Um, it's likened to uh, the flood with Noah. The, the the earthly man goes down the spiritual and the, the new creation comes up right just like in the in, in the flood the evil was washed away and the one righteous man was came came out of it right so it, kind of the same idea um, then they laid their hands on on them and they received the Holy Spirit now we have the third baptism of the Christian receives this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit once again it does not make you any more saved it empowers you to live as a good witness. It empowers you to be dedicated to the Lord. Okay? That makes sense? So, um, once again, though, we have here, they, and they receive the Holy Spirit, doesn't say anything about, about, about the speaking in tongues. Nor does it really imply. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on, on of uh, apostles' hands, he offered them money. What did he see? Well, it doesn't say, does it? It just be he saw them laying hands on them. Right. Like, yeah. did yeah. was it accompanied by by miracles? Was it like, well, did they speak in tongues? What it was it? What is it that he saw? It doesn't clarify. Right. So we don't know. So then going down to ten forty four through forty eight. However, I do think that it is worth noting that it, that it is possible. It is possible that Luke is writing in such a way to include everything. By saying the first, what happened the first time and the same time, I mean, so first time, the last time, and the middle time, saying that every time it happened. That is possible. It is possible, but we don't know for sure. Okay, so I'm not trying to downplay the role of the Assemblies of God. I'm licensed with the Assemblies of God. Um, I, I do encourage people to look for the speaking in tongues as, as the evidence of that. But um, I do just want to kind of give words of warning here. We're not, we're not creating loopholes for people to hop through are we you know what i mean and you'll know in your spirit you'll know if you're faking it or if you really were baptized in the Holy spirit you'll know um and you'll also know if you're just getting fired up in the flesh you'll you'll know you might not know it know right off but I, I i've seen some people stick to this so bad that this is actually um what happened to to me and some friends you know supposedly the holy spirit was given supposedly um, so repeat after me. Say you know, and then they would they would coach you on what what words to speak in tongues. You know, uh, Buddha bar or whatever. Then you repeat that, and then they would say something else, and then you repeat that. See, what I mean, it's not actually the spirit giving you utterance; it's you repeating somebody else. Right. Hopefully, as the spirit gave them utterance, you will. Hopefully, you'll catch on. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, and and then people kind of get weird with it in another way. You need to expand. Your vocabulary in the in, in speaking in tongues. <laughs> I feel like if God wants you to speak more, He will, and if He wants you to remember words, He will. Okay, I, I I feel like it is worth noting that the gifts of the Spirit in First Corinthians, where it talks about speaking in tongues, those were not recited words like where you were just repeating yourself. That does happen. Where God gives you gives you words and you remember them and, and, and when you go into prayer you, you prayer you use them absolutely that does happen. Okay. However, what's happening there is God is giving them an utterance in another tongue. Okay, and then they are saying it and somebody gives an interpretation. It's a bit different. Okay. So, um, and did I finish up that? I did. Ten forty four through forty eight. While Peter was still. Uh, saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. This one also has a speaking in tongues, but it, all, but it also says they're extolling God. It seems like it's a very obvious thing when people are baptized, that you see it. Because what happens in all the different occurrences God's glorified in the midst of it. Uh, at least in three of the occurrences, they spoke in tongues. And the people usually worship and glorify the name of the Lord. Right? Mm -hmm. So, I, I, But it's something above and beyond the regular just praising God because it caused them to specifically pay attention. Simon, for instance, he was so enamored by this that he offered them money for it. 
clearly it was something more than they just said, praise Jesus. Right. Do you know what I mean? Clearly it was something else, something more obviously powerful. Um, then Peter declared, can anyone uh, withhold water for baptizing these people who, are, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So here they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he's like, hey, let's baptize, baptize you in water too. So, um, can you be baptized if you haven't been saved? You can be used in, in, in the, by the Holy Spirit if you aren't saved, but can you be baptized in the Holy Spirit if you aren't saved? Well, Serena was, right, before she got saved. I don't know. Where do you get that I from? she said she was. Hmm. I don't know. As far as, I'm more talking about the Bible. I'm not really talking about personal experience. Oh, but, I mean, um, that it's possible. I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, with Serena. Um, the Bible, is, it, see, it's a little bit tricky. Because when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I didn't see myself as a Christian. Like, I mean, I guess I was saved, but I just felt like, you know, I never read the Bible. I was, I never prayed. I just felt like I was, wasn't even really walking a walk. I was just kind of like, oh yeah, I'm saved. You know what I mean? So I kind of saw myself as not really saved, even though I technically probably was because I asked the Lord to save me. See what I mean? <laughs> so I, I guess kind of in a way, but I don't know. I, at that time, because I, I wasn't spiritually growing there. You see what I mean? But once again, it takes people a while to grow. So it's like, well, maybe I was saved. I don't know. I'm um, in Acts 2, 38 through 39. And, and I do want to say, the Bible oftentimes will say something along, along the lines of implying that you can't be without being saved. And... It's hard to know for sure because I've heard many stories of people singing they were baptized in the Holy Spirit up before they were saved. So it's like, well, I don't know. Maybe? Maybe it's kind of like being baptized in the Holy Spirit, but not really, and the Holy Spirit was just strongly impressing on them to be saved. I don't know. See, and the thing is, we can't know for certain either because we weren't there. And we can't know for certain because we aren't God. So we don't know. <laughs> See what I mean? A lot of things with the Holy Spirit, a lot of people will tell you this, 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 and a lot of it is just made up man doctrine. Okay? So we, you need to be careful. But with that being said, I've said that part. Now I need to say the other part. There's a lot of people who go and make the Holy Spirit word things. There are no rules. You know, their experience is primary. It's all about the Holy Spirit. You know, all these different things, they just get off basis. So let's try and find an equal balance between the two. Okay? Acts 2, 38-39 says, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you will receive as mutually inclusive of being saved, or as different thought. By the way, you can be saved, and you can also receive the Holy Spirit. Does, is he saying an order, or is he not? I don't know. For the promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, even everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So we have a lot of questions. The answer is a firm maybe. <laughs> is it the rule that normally people are baptized uh, after they've been saved, or is it, or is, it, or is it an exception? For see what I mean? Is it a rule every time that somebody is baptized in the Holy Spirit? It doesn't matter if they're saved or not. Or is it the exception? People are saved, and then they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, except for the few odd occurrences. Yeah. But with that being said, I think I think pastors, pastors' teachings on Wednesday night are extremely valuable, and I would highly encourage you guys to go or to pick up the CDs, whatever. Um, he's been talking a lot about this. Um, people try and, and, and have the Holy Spirit is without rules. You know what I mean? Um, like the thing with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This list isn't exhaustive because I want to add my own things in there. You know, when it says the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, no, no, that, that list, it, that doesn't list everything just because I want to make up my own stuff. And we talked about this last week. I don't want to get into that. Um, or, you know, the thing with the whole evidence of, the whole, of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't think that, that it's the only evidence because I want to have make up my own evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't like that people lord it over me that they're baptized in the Holy Spirit and I'm not. So I'm just going to say that I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit when I never had that encounter. See what I mean? There has to be some some balance, and there are definitely rules, right? Mm -hmm. So I hope that you guys understand what I'm saying. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
Does anybody not understand what I'm saying? By show of hands, so I can see. Because I want to be able to actually address this. No? We're all good? I'm going to move on. Everybody's okay with that? Awesome. So why speaking in tongues? Scott Camp gives us, gives an idea that I don't know exactly what to make of it. He, he says it has more to do with reconciliation with God. In the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, people, sinned, people were very prideful against God. They all came together to do this prideful thing, and God gave them different, different tongues that, that just caused more confusion and spread them out among the world. Whereas with, the, with speaking in tongues, it's the exact opposite. He brings us together, gives us this, this tongue for the purpose of edifying us, and then if the interpretation is given, edifying the church as well. Instead of it causing mass confusion, it causes encouragement. See what I mean? So he sees it more like that. And I think there might be something there. However, um, there are other views. John Wyckoff had a very interesting view. and I didn't really want to write it down, though, because it was kind of a lengthy thing, and I didn't want to get sidetracked. <laughs> uh, um, <coughs> but it has been said that the tongue is the most unruly part of the body. Maybe speaking in tongues because that's the most difficult thing to submit our mouth to God. If we can submit our mouth to God, surely we are submitted to God. And and that's something. That is something. Um, it goes beyond human understanding. Yeah. It's not something you can just make up. You know, it's something that goes beyond what, what, what I would agree with that too. Um, it builds us up. Yeah, that's true. Even Paul acknowledged that. That's true. Um, I will say this though. Don't seek when you're seeking to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, don't seek speaking in tongues. Seek to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And get this. If speaking in tongues is the evidence, you're going to speak in tongues. You don't have to try and find the evidence. You have to You have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. See what I mean? So if we're seeking the gift giver instead of the gift, hey, we're fine. See what I mean? Well, I think we go into error when we don't do that. And I, once again, I feel really strong about this, so I'm not going to drop it. I'm going to go back to it again. Pastor has made an enormous, enormous, gone to enormous extents to talk about not making up weird stuff and not getting involved in the weird stuff. And I think that God laid it on his heart for a very specific reason. And I think me as associate pastor, I need to encourage that too. And I need to back up what Pastor said. And I totally do. There's a lot of weird things. And I know I've, I'm trying to make this as a, a, the least amount of legalism that I humanly possibly can. However, I do think that because of the weirdness that there is in the culture, I need to also back up what Pastor felt was necessary to back up. If somebody who's baptized in the Holy Spirit, you should look for a firm evidence, like speaking in tongues. If somebody's got a gift, of the, a gift given by the Holy Spirit, you should look for evidences. See what I mean? Like the fruit of the Spirit. If, 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 some, if, if the gifts of, of the Spirit are being used in a church setting, you should look for it to be on track with first first corinthians chapter 12 right see what i mean we need to be careful of the weird because there's a lot of people out there who believe a lot of weird things and we can't get sucked up into it okay that's exactly what happened with gideon in the book of judges okay god was calling him to do great things he's got so focused on the weird things that people around him were believing that he ended up creating idols himself when god wanted him to free the people of israel from idols so um the, it would be then speaking in tongues would be spirit to spirit communication as the Holy Spirit you know reveals to us in that in that deeper way and like the psalmist says in, in Psalms as deep cries out to deep you know we, you have that 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 deepness that can't be explained necessarily in words so um, these are all all good ideas oh, overfilling of heart empties from mouth I think that's I think that's something to look at too um, Jesus always ta Jesus talked about how from the abundance of the heart the heart the mouth speaks right. So surely if the Holy Spirit was filling us, was baptizing us, right? Surely there would be some kind of outward manifestation, right? Right. I mean, that makes sense. Um, some may claim tongues when they aren't really baptized. I think I've said this every way that I can. There's a lot of weird things out there, guys. Um, and when you're talking about the Holy Spirit, nowadays it's such, it's such a pain to talk about the Holy Spirit nowadays. And the reason for it is... 
that people have all these preconceived biases about the Holy Spirit. So you have to wade through these 10 miles of, of your own personal, or of these people's bias before you can actually talk about the Holy Spirit. Pastor on Wednesday night's been having to talk about the Holy Spirit now three years or so before he actually got to get to actual substance about the Holy Spirit. Why? Because so many different people have so many weird views about stuff that's just not true. So, um, I think that there is definitely a basis for speaking in tongues being an evidence. There is definitely a basis for that. So, yeah. Anything else I want to say about this? No, there's not. So why be baptized? Um, what are some ideas that you guys think of besides spiritual direction? Because you saw that on the screen. <laughs> why be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Not not the water baptism. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. Why? Um. So you can pray. So God. Uh, what are you trying to say? Like intercessory prayer. You don't. So really, you can be a prayer on behalf of others. Behalf of others and maybe yourself as well. Like sometimes you don't know what to pray in, and, and so, like at that time, I, you know, you pray in tongues, and I feel like God's. Say it. Um, okay. Say it. All right. No, that's fine. Like that, everybody understands what she's saying, right? Yeah. The Holy Spirit uses you to pray for something that He wants you to pray for. Right, and you don't necessarily always know what it is. Right. 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 Okay. Anything else to pray to pray for for uh, hidden needs? Anything else? To be able to witness. Okay. That's one of the big reasons in Acts. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I feel like it brings you closer to God. Okay. One thing I noticed, um, and I'm not saying anybody here is, is saying this. I'm just in encouraging you not to. Be careful when people talk about what the Holy Spirit can do for you. Because when the Holy Spirit moves, it's, it moves us out to do something for others. See what I mean? Does that, make, does that kind of make sense? Did, did you say something? You, you said something about mm -hmm. an, uh, 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 a reason. Oh, yeah, oh, witnessing. In Right? Uh, yeah, witnessing. Were you going to say something else? Well, I had said earlier that a lot of times, like, if you're using a word or that, you know it's the Holy Spirit because it reflects upon the Holy Spirit. Right. And right. Not you. Right. So. Um, and uh, I want to uh, hop on what he said just a second ago. Uh, that was good, too, but just a second ago, he talked about witnessing. That's one of the key things that Acts talks about with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit doesn't <coughs> move us to love ourselves more. I'm just going to serve myself all day. By all means, you should, you should accept yourself and you should love yourself because you're not going to be able to love other people or even test, testify to other people if you haven't reached that place in yourself. We'll talk about that in a couple weeks when we talk about self-image. I'm not talking about that tonight. Sorry for the distraction. Back on, to back on topic. A lot of times people make the Holy Spirit all about what he can do for you. He comforts you. He makes you feel better. He, you know, he does all this different. Well, that's great. But if the Holy Spirit isn't moving us out, to witnessing, to growing God's kingdom, to something, it's probably Spirit not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> See, I mean, because we do the whole self-focus thing. We do that great on our own. Oh, yeah. We do that great on our own. Okay, anybody who's married knows this. One day you wake up and you're like, okay, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to show love to my spouse. I got this. Then the next day you're like, <sighs> you know what I mean? The struggle's real, guys. You you single people laugh all you want, <clears throat> but the struggle's real, okay? Uh, and uh, you know, you, 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 the church has demonstrated over the past couple hundred years why we need the Holy Spirit. 
let's start with the imperialized church. Okay. Church becomes synonymous with Rome. Don't really want to get into the history of it, but it does. So what what's good, what's good, gets going? They start paying attention on, on building really good buildings, on making sure they have a firm, solid doctrine, on making sure that that all the ordinances and traditions are, are, are upheld. And so then we have the Crusades, where they say, it's our responsibility to go out and murder people. Why not? Okay. It's exactly the same manifest destiny that happened in America when the when they came over here and said, oh yeah, it's our, it's our duty to kill off the Indians. It, it, it's just, God's appointed us to kill them. It, it's fine. They're not really people anyways. See what I mean? The absence of the Holy Spirit. People come to all kinds of stupid ideas, don't they? So I think the church has proven perfectly fine why we need the Holy Spirit. Because they go in a place of only caring for themselves, only paying attention to themselves, not reaching out to the world, right? Not being compassionate to other people, not serving other people, uh, thinking that they're better than other people. I mean, let's go down the list of all the things that Christianity has proven that we need the Holy Spirit. If you need any more evidence, go read a history book of Christianity. I mean, goodness sakes. Huh? <laughs> I think that we don't need any more evidence. But anyways, going on. Uh, spiritual direction. He guides the church. Uh, gift and blessings. Uh, oh, let me read that to you, actually. Matthew 3.11. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay? Um, John 16.5-7. says this but now I am going to him who sent me and none of you ask me where are you going but because I have said these things to you sorrow has filled your heart nevertheless I tell you the truth it is to your advantage that I go away for if I do not go away the helper will not come to you but if I go I will send him to you where am I going to seven okay that's good um, and then Acts 10 38 How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So even Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit. Um, so obviously, uh, it's a gift and a blessing from God to be you. You know what I mean? Like, have you ever had someone that you have you ever had someone that you were very strongly emotionally tied to, like a boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or, or husband? Okay, and they give you something. How badly would it hurt their feelings if you didn't even open it and said, I don't want that? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, when, when they put thought and care into giving you something and you just throw it away without even opening it. In essence, that's what people do with the Holy Spirit. Jesus went so that he could give us the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's a gift for us. Hey, guys, <laughs> take this. Okay? Um, and what some people do is, that looks weird. I don't even want anything to do with that. So they haven't even opened the gift, and they've rejected it when it was a gift from God. But I do want to um, say something that I thought was interesting. The gifts of the Spirit that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians doesn't really seem like overall they do that much outside of church. Weird, huh? Mm -hmm. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit seems like it's almost exclusively for outside of the church. Weird, right? Mm -hmm. Just something to think about that I was noticing. So, anyways, uh, Acts. I already said read that one. Okay, so uh, baptized means immersed in spirit. Over, it's an overflow. I already talked about this. Uh, um, and then Acts leaves off with the idea that people that the Christian that the church should be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And never in the church did it ever give off any implication that this was a limited time. That you should be baptized and continually be baptized. It's not a one-and-done kind of thing. In the course of your life, you're going to need to do it repeatedly throughout your life, right? Mm -hmm. And then out of that, but the church continually needs it. Um, think of... Uh, 
I'm not sure I want to really get going on this. Well, no, I don't. I don't want to get on on this. I'll, I'll just very quickly uh, mention this. Think of uh, you know. Um, a pitcher of water, you pour water into your cup and you drink drink the water and then you never need water again. No, you, I mean, you're going to need to mm -hmm. pour some more into your cup and you're going to need to drink more water, right? right. Um, it's kind of like that. Um, except the baptism in the Holy Spirit is kind of like you have a cup of water and you're pouring from a pitcher and it's overflowing from the cup and it's still pouring into it. That's a good example of what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is like. Um, so... Um, how to be baptized? This is the easiest part of all. First, you repent from your sin. Okay, because all I, can be people be baptized by the Holy Spirit if they're not saved? I don't know. I don't care to know. Right? That's not important for me to know. What is important is what 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 Acts lines out. Some people aren't baptized with the Holy Spirit because they're trying to still live their way, and they want the Holy Spirit to accommodate them. And that's not what he does. So um, repent from sin, worship, and seek after God. I mean, that's that's the second step right there. Just just enjoy God's presence, God in your timing, in your in your timing. That's it, right? Um, and then study Scripture. You know, immerse yourself in God's Word. And lastly, ask and keep asking. Then allow it to be refilled. You ask, He gives. I mean, it's not like it's rocket science. He said, "Ask me of this, and I'm going to give it to you." It's not like we're, we're bending God's arm behind his back. God wants us to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. See what I mean? Like, it's that simple. He said, ask, and I'll give it. So that's what we do. We ask, and he gives it. Right. So um, really really the easiest part of the whole thing there. Um, I do want to strongly encourage that people get this, though, the ESV Study Bible. Um, it's the This one is the Fire Bible, which is the one that I encourage because it's more for charismatic people. Um, you know, a lot of other ones, uh, other study Bibles you're going to get there, they try to explain away things about the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, people aren't really saved anymore. I mean, not saved. I mean, people aren't, aren't don't really experience the gifts of the Holy Spirit anymore. Um, speaking in tongues is outdated. You know, they just go all through these qualifiers of, you know, the little bit the, and then the Holy Spirit can actually do. And, and by the end of it, they've resolved that the only thing the Holy Spirit does is convict us in our hearts. Oh, how nice. Anyways. Um, so being baptized is really really simple. Ask in faith. This doesn't mean that you don't have any doubts. This means that you ask God and expect him to, to answer. Um, focus on God, not the gift. I already mentioned that. Relax and worship. Sometimes people get so worked up and, and trying to be baptized in the Holy Spirit that, you know what I mean, it becomes a stressor. In fact, I think Diana last week was talking about how people were like pressuring her into it, and it became a thing where she was she was actually getting to the point of being mad. Right. You know? like yeah, it does. And it's like just... Lay off, guys. Uh, Let it happen how God wants it to happen. Just seek the Lord and, and come naturally. Yeah. Um, well, I don't want to say let it come naturally because it's not going to come naturally. Oh. Because in our spirit, we don't want to have more of God. Really, we, we want to have more of ourselves. Oh, yeah. You know, Paul talked about this when he said, "There's always this war inside of me that I do the things that I don't want to do, and I don't do the things that I want to do." And it's kind of like that. We, you know, the natural naturally, it's not going to happen. But we have to pursue it. But with that being said. Don't try and demand it in your timing is what I get. What I'm getting at. Right. Um, so, however, if you feel like um, you know, if you feel like you think you're being baptized and you feel like you should say something, just say it. Okay, just let the words flow. They don't have to make sense. They don't have to be a language that you understand. They don't have to be a language that you know. Just open your mouth and let it happen. You don't have to say it loud. You don't have to be the center of attention. But just let it happen. Okay. Um, and it also doesn't matter how much it is. Some people think that you have to have like a word minimum. It has to be like the, like a word count minimum, like on papers that they have you turn in for school. It's not like that at all. It could be one word. It could be one syllable. Okay, don't don't get so bent out of shape about well, that. Well, you know, uh, I don't remember where it's found, but it talks about that the spirit speaks in groans and utterances and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, about so, first Corinthians, yeah. You know, may not be sound even like a word. <laughs> that's that's funny because last week we were talking about the way that the word translates uh, a tongue in in First uh, Corinthians twelve, 
uh, isn't necessarily even a, a spoke, just something to do with your mouth. So that's kind of funny. Anyways, um, so speak even if it sounds strange. Uh, we had a question, and I wanted to address that question. We'll close with this because it's getting kind of late. Are there hidden books of the Bible? I'm actually asked this quite often. And uh, so let's look at that. The answer is a firm yes and no. <laughs> let's start with some of this, okay? The first is called the Apocrypha. Now, this is not in Protestant Bibles. Like this Bible right here, it's not in here. However, in the Catholic Bible, it is. And a lot of more Orthodox Christianity read it, read the Apocrypha, okay? Um, these are like the books of Maccabees and stuff, okay? But then there's also other apocryphal books that are an apocrypha, but they're not the apocrypha. Confusing, right? Yeah. Uh, an example of this would be like the apocryphal book of Acts. Great example. Mm -hmm. Where it's not actually included in the apocrypha. It's in nobody's Bibles, but I mean it is an apocryphal book. So there's that. Um, and then there's the Gnostic Gospels. Now these are books that... Um, were written by a group called the Gnostics who believed believed they 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 tried to make people believe that they had this secret hidden knowledge that Jesus only gave to certain elect few and it was their job to to reserve this here's the problem all the different groups of Gnostics had their own different things that they claimed Jesus left with them Second off, none of the church leaders claimed that there was any any such hidden knowledge. Third off, these were consi confined to the select few, not to Christianity as a whole. All of Christianity was handed down to everyone, not the select few. Right. See what I mean? And so in Gnosticism, we have the exact opposite. We are so spiritual that God, Jesus left us with this, even though he didn't tell anybody else. This. But that group over there says that Jesus also gave them select knowledge. Well, yeah. And do you have any proof of this? No. And most of the Gnostic Gospels were written long after the New Testament was written anyways. Like, we're talking about after 100 AD. The only exception is the Gospel of Thomas, which was possibly written as early as, like, the 60s AD, which was about the same time that Luke Acts was written. So that tells you Jesus died in the 30s AD. It's only 30 years afterwards. That's quite a statement. The problem is we don't really know when Gnosticism got started. Could have happened before, during, or after the church's uh, church uh, the church's start. Yeah. So we really don't know. So we really can't give too clear clear of an answer on things like the Gospel of Thomas. Once again, kind of at a, at a stance there. So are these hidden books of the Bible? Well, they are hidden books in the sense that Gnostic means um, from the Greek gnosis uh, knowledge. I think is what it means, and it, the idea is a hidden knowledge, right? Um, and uh, so, yes, it is a hidden book in that sense, but it's not really a Christian book, so it's not really of the Bible. Second off, books had to go through a certain – they had to meet certain qualifications to be considered part of the Bible, and Gnostic Gospels didn't hit any of those. The Apocrypha didn't either. But they were held on to because they were considered religious books. Not spoken out by God, but still religious. And so the church held on to them. However, about the time of the Reformation, uh, you know – well, I don't really want to say when, because this is something that happened over a long period of time. Christians, Protestants eventually said, no, these books are not equal with Scripture. So they just took them out of the Bible. Whereas the Catholics went the other route. They said, okay, we have the authority, and to prove that we have the authority over the Protestants, we're going to stick them in the Bible. Well, okay. So, in a way, they were kind of hidden... But not really, because we knew that they were there. We just knew that they weren't really scripture until the Catholics decided all of a sudden that they were scripture, even though historically we didn't think that they were scripture. I don't know why they... Anyways, sometimes I think that Catholic, the Catholic Church just looks for things to divide them from the Protestants, honestly. It's like, you know what? It's not good enough that Mary was a virgin. Let's say that she was sinless, too. <laughs> why why are you doing this like why why it's not good enough that we have a leader the pope now we're going to claim that peter was the first pope and then he handed this down and there's been a lineage of popes <laughs> awesome wow awesome anyways um so then the other apocryphal books they're hidden in the sense that nobody believed that they were of the uh, that they were christian right i mean they're just they're just books um 
And uh, then did I say everything about the Gnostic Gospels? Probably not, but that's probably all you need to know. So are there hidden books? No, not really. There, are, A lot of people will say something like um, Egypt had this secret hidden religion that Christianity tried its best to hide and all this different stuff. There's no basis for this. I mean, it's just there. there's not even a references that they can claim. I mean, these are just completely off-the-wall claims. It would be the exact same thing as if I said, um, I saw that uh, Zach's foot is actually an alien that looks like a foot. Do I have any... Proof of my claim? No. None whatsoever. So why should I believe it? So I mean, it's basically the same thing. Are there hidden books? No, there are, there are no hidden books that Christianity is hiding from people. There are books that we have openly said, no, these are not, um, like the Gnostic Gospels, but there are no hidden books. And the la the, So the short answer is no, but there is, once again, longer answers. <laughs> and there's stuff like pseudepigrapha and that kind of stuff, and, and there's all kinds of other things like that. But when it comes to when the rubber meets the road, there are no books that Christianity has deliberately hid from people. Okay. Um, there's books that they have openly said that is not of God, and we're not gonna uh, I'm gonna have it here. But yeah. Um, but are there yeah? So any questions on that? No, everybody's good. Awesome. Um, and so the question of the week: Who is your authority in your life? Who is, who, is, who is an authority over you? Let's think about it, and we'll meet back on that next week. Okay? Sure, Breeze. Do what? Sure, Breeze. Well, Any questions know. before I stop the recording? Um, one thing that I've, I've seen a lot in the churches is that being rebaptized in the Holy Spirit, uh -huh. is that biblical? Yeah, it, it happens in Acts, for instance. You know, they'll be baptized, and then, you know, I mean, you've been in the church how long? You know this happens. People get baptized, but then they just kind of start to coast. You know, you know what I mean? And you need something fresh. And, and the Bible talks about that a lot. You know, about the pastors talked about this with you. The second rain. You know, the the the, the continual work of the baptism that records people being baptized multiple times. It records, you know, things about. Um, you know, all the kinds of different stuff like that. I, I, if you want, I could look up specific verses for you uh, and have them for next week. Just... No, I, you just didn't really touch on it. Oh, okay. Much tonight, so. did, did that answer it? or? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Any other questions? I have a story. You go for it. But okay. we are recording, so are you okay with it being recorded? No, it's okay. It's not okay. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, sorry. Huh. The po points you're making about concentrating on God and just worship, you know? Uh -huh. uh, there was this one uh, pastor that came and I uh, was talking and his message was speaking on tongues. And, uh, he, you know, the example he gave was one time they were praying for somebody and the wife, the husband uh, got baptized and started speaking in tongues, but the wife didn't. And then after so long, finally she was just like, Pastor, I have to pee. <laughs> and he's like, okay, go. And then right after she peed, as she was walking into the sanctuary, she started speaking in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't concentrate on what That's she awesome. Because she had to pee so bad. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments?